G'day out there. Uh, today I want to discuss justified by the blood, um, the context of why Jesus offered himself up upon the cross and how it works to justify the repentant sinner. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of scriptures here and go through just a, so um, just be patient, um, take notes or just follow along with the scriptures and just try to reason through this stuff. There's a lot of confusion out there, um, mainly due to the preaching of substitution, which is preach pretty much everywhere. So a lot of people look at the cross in more a um, abstract sense of something that happened out there that's apart, disconnected from them, and then they're trusting in that as the hope of their salvation. When we're actually meant to partake in the cross, we die with Christ, we're raised with him, and it's through that working dynamic that the heart is actually changed, and because of the heart is changed, it comes into agreement with God. The love of God is shed abroad in the heart, and then we become like God in the sense that we're spiritually aligned with him instead of spiritually against him. And that's really the basis of how justification works. And I'll get into that and explain exactly that with what the scripture teaches. So today I'm going to start with um, Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to just read through, just starting at verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in that verse there, we see that there's, we're justified by faith. And remember, faith works by love, love works no ill. Faith is, you know, the wholehearted yielding to God. Um, and that's that's why it's the, the moving dynamic of, of obedience. You know, in Romans um, chapter 16, it talks about the obedience of faith. And that's because faith is, you, you look at Abraham, you look at Noah, what did Noah do? He, by faith, he built the ark. Because he trusted God, he believed God, and he yielded to God. And so faith was what moved him. And so it's by faith we have peace with God, because it's by faith that we, we do what we need to do to be reconciled with God. But the way we are reconciled is through our Lord Jesus Christ, so, you know, through the spirit of his life. That's what sets us free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8.2. So in verse 2 here, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice hope of the glory of God. So it's by Jesus Christ we have access into this grace through which um, we're saved. In Rome, um, verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It's a very important scripture. It's, it's the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And that's talking about regeneration. See, because we can't, we can't have our own love apart from the love of God, because the love of God is the real, the real deal. It's the real genuine love. And remember, the new covenant is where God will write his law in our mind and on our hearts. And the new covenant is a covenant of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Not a covenant of the, of the letter. And, the, and it's the Spirit that brings life. And it brings life through the love of God being shed abroad in our heart, where we, where we therefore walk by a faith that works by love, and love working no ill. So we love one another as he loved us. Um, so I've got... Um, for when we were yet yeah, without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So, you know, he died for sinners when we were yet sinners. You know, he, God made the first move, in other words, in saying, you know, I want, I want to be reconciled with you and I'm going to do something. And he did it. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. He commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, that's just so amazing that it's God took the initiative. Not we didn't because we're in rebellion and, and in darkness and we, we couldn't perceive God. But, you know, this is in a general sense of humanity, you know, because, of course, myself, I wasn't alive back then. But the principle's the same. You know, God took the initiative. He made, he made the first move. For when we were enemies, we were, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life and um, I'll probably do a video on this another time about how what, what this means about being reconciled while we were yet enemies a lot of people think oh you're, you're reconciled to God while you're still in your sins and it's like no 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 it's to do with you know the repentant sinner coming to God 
and because they've still got sin to their account, they're guilty. They're an enemy of God in that sense, and then God, you know, then they're reconciled from that to to God, and all that is washed away, not counted against them anymore. And then we're saved by His life, you know, through abiding in the Spirit of His life, which keeps us from going back that way. And that's why in Romans eight two it says, for the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ, you know, the abiding state saves us from the law of sin and death. So there's no, we're no longer committing sin unto death, like in James chapter one. Um, where it says, you know, how sin in uh, verses 14, 15, where it talks about how, you know, where every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. That's the law of sin and death. If, you know, if you sin, you die, and that cuts you off from God, you spiritually die. And see, the spirit of life in Jesus Christ is the antidote to that. And that's why the spirit of life in Jesus Christ sets us free from the law of sin and death. You know, because you know, when we walk after the spirit, the righteousness of the law or the true righteousness of God um, is, is um, brought in us. And so we come into an agreement with God. Again, it's the love of God being shed abroad in our heart. You know, is when we walk after the spirit, we're submitted to the spirit and it can, it can just bloom in us. But when we're walking against God, it would shut that down and we'd, we'd be casting the spirit out. And so then that love wouldn't be present. So then in Romans 5.11, and this is the key verse here, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So the word atonement there, it's G3, uh, it's G2643, and it's catalage, catalage, Probably pronounced it wrong, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. And what that means is exchange, figuratively adjustment, that is restoration to the divine favor, atonement, reconciliation. Now, as I've got up here on the board, Romans 5.11, atonement, cattle age, G2643. It's only used um, four times in the New Testament. Everywhere else, or three times, if it's four times, it's in this verse. It's in both 18 and 19 in 2 Corinthians 5. It's translated on reconciliation everywhere else. And the context bears out reconciliation. So um, I think it's pretty certain that the use of the word in Romans 5.11 is biased because of substitution theology. And I go into a lot of the detail of this, the history of this in my book, um, One in Us, It is a Gift of God, which is, is available free on request. And you can also go to lulu.com. Um, download it for more in-depth explanations of the history of this sort of thing and where all this came from. Um, and again, it's free, no, no charge at all. And if anyone wants a hard copy of it, you can just contact me and I'll even post you out a, a free copy, no charge. Because I just want people to understand this and come to a real knowledge of the truth. So uh, we'll get back to this in, in a moment, but I've got here, um, so we've got the substitution. Under substitution, the basic premise of you know why we're justified by the blood is penalty paid. That's the predominant view, and often it's the um, it's the penal substitution view, which is Jesus bore the full wrath of God, and because that wrath has been poured out on Jesus, it's no longer due anymore. Kind of like you're driving down the road and you get pulled over for speeding, and then you get issued an infringement notice and a speeding fine, and then you've got to pay off that speeding fine. For it to, to be, you know, to be extinguished or to go away, is you, you, you tender the debt, um, and the penalty paid is the notion that well, someone else, Jesus, he come and he pays your speeding fine for you, and because the fine has been paid, it's no longer due anymore, and that's how they view justified by the blood, while it's not really because that's not forgiveness of sin. Like the the, the penalty paid is not a forgiveness of the penalty; it's just it's been paid off by someone else. And um, what that leads to is a positional salvation. And what I mean by that is that in what the Bible teaches, so we'll go to Hebrews chapter 9 real quickly, where it talks about why Jesus died. So just give me a, a moment, I'll turn to Hebrews chapter 9. So we start in verse 14. And this is a scripture I do refer to a lot, but it's so important, it's so key. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, see, the, the justified by the blood, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, 
So he didn't offer himself with our spots, as many teach. Many teach that the sin of man was imputed to Jesus, so it was put on him. And then God poured out his wrath on Jesus instead of us, as Jesus you know, took upon our guilt in a sense. And then, you know, that wrath was all poured out. He's, he's paying the fine. And then it's on that basis that this transaction happened that um, men are saved. But see, it's, it's, a, it's a transaction that's out there in the cosmos, some adjustment that took place. And then people are justified by the blood in the false church system because they, they believe it happened. They think that this, this, this transaction, this cosmic exchange took place, which it didn't. The Bible doesn't teach it. But what it does is it, it's, it removes the transformation of the heart from the redemption process, from the reconciliation process. Thus, nothing really happens. They're, they're trusting in a forensic justification. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But in Hebrews 9.14, so we got again, I'll read it. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So it's talking here very clearly that, that the blood purges the conscience of dead works that we may serve the living God. And then in the very next verse, and it says, and for this cause, what was the cause? The cause is to purge the conscience of dead works to serve the living God, not to pay any kind of sin debt. So for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament. So this is the whole purpose of the New Testament, the new covenant, the covenant of the spirit, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to the, all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. You see, that was like establishing a covenant between the law and the people. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined to you. So they were enjoined in the covenant to, to the law, the law of Moses, the old covenant. But see, the new covenant is of the Spirit. If we turn to, I mentioned this scripture earlier, but if we turn to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, no, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3 and verse 6 is what I meant. Just bear with me. I'm not perfect here. I went to 1 Corinthians, but now I'm in 2 Corinthians. Here we go. And Paul is writing about the new covenant. And he says here, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. And that's the major difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant was of the letter. It was of outward regulation. The schoolmaster, the Lord, appoint to Jesus Christ. But the new covenant is of the spirit. And it's, it's, it's through the spirit, you know, it sheds the love abroad in the heart. And then instead of obeying rules and regulations, we, are, we just walk in, in the spirit of love. Love God with all our heart, soul and mind and our neighbor as ourself through the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. And that's, and that's why the new covenant is so powerful. Because then you don't need thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not murder. Because you genuinely have a genuine love, and not our own love, that's just wrought in and of ourselves. No, it's the love of God abiding in us. Because we abide in Him, and He abides in us. You know, one in us. And Christ in us, the hope of glory, same thing. And so... Um, and that's what it's talking about in Hebrews, you know, purge the conscience of dead works. Because any work done apart from the Spirit is essentially a dead work. And what do, what's Hebrews talk about? You know, repentance from dead works. See, re a genuine repentance, yeah, you repent from sin. But what is sin? Sin is walking apart from God and doing things apart from God. So we repent of that. We yield ourselves to God. And under the new covenant, His Spirit comes into us and dwells us and writes that law on our heart. 
in our mind. And that's why it's talking about how, you know, those who are sanctified are perfected forever by the one offering of Jesus Christ. It establishes a real purity of heart in the individual who's come to God and come clean and then yielded themselves to God. This is, this is what the Bible teaches very clearly. Um, so under substitution, you know, the, the penalty is paid. There's, there's no coming to God and being purged and purified. That's eliminated. That's why they don't teach that in the church system. You'll never hear that. They, they, won't, they won't go to Hebrews 9, 14 and talk about purge your conscience of dead works. That, that just doesn't exist in their theology. And that's why they don't preach the, the crucifixion of the old man, like in Romans in chapter 6, where it talks about, um, you know, we're crucified with him. Um, I'll go there real quick. That's another scripture that I refer to a lot. But see, they don't they don't teach this in the um, the church system because there's it doesn't it, there's no need to because their the basis of their justification is purely forensic. It's purely positional, legal transaction which they're trusting in. It's like a, like a, something written in a book. It's just something that happened, but nothing to do with the heart. They throw the heart transformation right out the window. And then they try to, you know, they still speak with great swelling words about morality and give moral lessons because they say the transformation happens afterwards. So you're justified in the false church system. You're justified in your sins, in your addictions. So all that changed is a legal thing. That's the danger. And then once people, if people believe that and they think that they're justified and they're really right with God because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, as they call it, not understanding what the finished work really is, then there's no desire to seek out the real deal because they've swallowed the deception. And, and that's why deception is so dangerous because it serves as a substitute for the truth. And then you're worshipping the substitute or the image. In Revelation, it talks about, you know, they worship the image. And that's what they're doing. Most of professing Christianity in the world is worshipping an image of the beast. And they're still addicted to their carnal passions. They haven't, they haven't died with Christ. Again, in Romans 6, where it talks about um, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. See, they don't teach that under this. Because, because that um, the death of the old man has to happen in this, but it doesn't have to happen in this. So they just ignore it completely. And if you look at my Paul Washer video, you'll see how Paul Washer just, just skips right over it. When he's asked this question specifically about Romans 6, 6 and 6, 7, he completely ignores the text of what Paul taught and then goes into this stuff. He starts talking about this. And so under substitution, you've got the penalty paid, you got the positional salvation because salvation is the position. It's not a manifest abiding state of abiding in Christ, abiding in the spirit of his life, abiding in love. There's no keeping yourselves in the love of God, like in Jude 1 21, because that, that's just, it's, it, the concept, concept is not there. So thus under the positional salvation, they have a sin repent cycle. They, they keep sinning, they keep repenting. They, they use 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, thinking that sin is some substance in them attached to their flesh, or some substance of the flesh, some ethereal thing that they can't really point to exactly, but they just associate it with their flesh, and that they're always going to be sinning. And so, and the, and the thing with under substitution, it's legality is the issue. See, they see the issue is the forgiveness of God. It's like, oh, well, God has to pour out his wrath on sin. He can't just forgive sin. Yet the Bible teaches God does forgive sin. So instead of having God forgive sin, he's... Um, they have someone paying the price for them in their place. See, that's why under substitution, Jesus is dying in your place. See, in the Bible, Jesus doesn't die in your place. Jesus dies on your behalf. So you can partake in suffering with him, following his example, you know, and we die with him. We're raised up with him. And in doing so, we die to sin. We escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. We escape the bondage of sin. And so... Um, talking about the Hebrews 9, chapter 14 through 17 that I read earlier, you know, the death of Christ, it established the new covenant and for the purpose of purging and purifying. And so the result of that is heart purity, which we can connect to, you know, Titus 2, 14, where it says he gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity 
and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. See, that, see they don't teach that in, under substitution because there is no purity because it's, it's, it's sin, repent, sin, repent. It, it's just an ongoing cycle. Even in the holiness churches, they still argue in favour of sin because it's the occasional sin, they think. It's, it's that you're occasionally messing up. And when they talk about that, it's, it's willful sin. They're not talking about um, a sin of ignorance, which we can all do in the sense of we do something and we don't realise it's wrong. Like, you know, how, how we maybe speak for someone, maybe not as patient as we should, or there's a better way to go about something. And then, you know, but of course, we, we learn and we grow in grace and knowledge. But Christianity, real Christianity, the, the, the start of this heart purity when someone becomes a genuine Christian. And you see that um, in 1 Peter, where Paul is speaking to babes in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he talks about the, the babe, babes in Christ. But in chapter 1, before he says that, he... Um, I'll go there real quick. Where he says, um, see this is in verses 22 and 23, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. See the soul, see the pure, pu the soul is purified through obedience to the truth. See this faith, wholehearted yielding to God, purifies the soul. That's why it says in Acts 15, 9, faith purifies the heart. Look that one up. So he's seeing ye have purified your souls you know, obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. See, Paul, Peter here, ties the new birth of being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. He ties it in with being purified your souls through obedience to the truth through the Spirit. See, the spirit of life in Jesus Christ sets us free from the law of sin and death. See, he purges our conscience of dead works and brings us alive to God. And that's why we can have reconciliation. That's why, that's why we can be reconciled to God. Because we, we come into the likeness of Christ. And see, see sin, and, sin and light and darkness cannot mix. So God has established a, a means which can take an individual who's dead in their sins, doing the wrong thing has a defiled heart, and transform them into someone who's like Christ. And that's, and that's the basis of um, justification. So we'll go back to um, Romans 5.11, and let's, let's look at some of these verses here. So if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which is a really important chapter, and there's a lot of meat in that, and we'll read, we'll read um, quite a little bit of that, because it talks about the, um, the ministry of reconciliation. And this is what's important to keep in mind. You want to keep in mind that um, the means to be brought back into the divine favour of God, you know, reconciled, it's through this, this transforming dynamic. So we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and what's he say here? He says, um, starting in verse 12, he says, For, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. So again, Paul is emphasizing the issue is the heart, not outward appearance. The real issue is the heart. Is what proceeds out of the heart is what defiles a man. That's what Jesus taught. You know, it's not what goes into the mouth. You know, it's with the heart that we believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth we confess unto, unto salvation. Um, so for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is to your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. And if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which should live, that, that they which live. So he's, he's the reason why he died. So you get, again, it's just all through the scripture. This. He goes, and they, that he died for all. See, Jesus died for everyone. Why? That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, 
Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. See, not after the, the physical flesh of Jesus, because it's through the Spirit. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So it's been a total transformation by the Spirit, a total reformation of the character. That doesn't happen under this, but it does happen under this. So that all things have become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So he reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, through inviting us to enter into the spirit of, his, of the life of Jesus Christ. And then if we do that, that's where we find the forgiveness of sins. And that's why in Romans chapter 8, 1 to 4, it says, you know, there's no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. Not because of some penalty paid position that people have in a sin repent cycle where a legality issue has been taken care of. No, because they've been established in a covenant with God. They've been purged and purified. The heart is pure. You know, the heart is the issue and the issue has been addressed. That's why. So we go on here. Um, you know, so I'll, again, I'll read to go back a bit. And all things are of God who hath reconciled to us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ see God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation see the, the word of reconciliation was committed unto Paul to go, to go and preach the gospel now then we are ambassadors for Christ just like an ambassador for a country you know, they're representing Christ as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So he's saying, you've got to be reconciled to God. How? Through this dynamic he's talking about. He goes, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, we enter in him, it's a, the abiding state. We're made the righteousness of God in him. We're literally made righteous. Um, how John went in the first epistle, of John, where he says that, um, let no man deceive you. He who does what is right is righteous. See, we do what is right and are righteous because we abide in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, where the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, Romans 8, 4. See, the parallel scripture for he who hath been, who, he who hath made him to be sin for us is Romans 8, 3 where he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. It's his figurative, it's figurative expression. It's not that Jesus was literally made to be sin, because sin is not a substance. You can't be literally made into sin. Sin is a concept of the will, um, choosing to do, you know, he who um, knows to do right and does not do it, to him it is sin, James 4, 17. Or transgression of the law in 1 John what, 3, 6, I think it is. It's, it's to, you know, sin is when we, uh, is a willful act to do the wrong thing when you know the right, the right thing to do. Um, it's not something you can be made into. So, you know, for he hath made him to be sin for us, sin offering, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You know, the grace of God that teaches us to, do, the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Titus 2, 11 and 12. That grace we can receive in vain if we don't yield to that teaching. That's what we say by grace through faith, because faith is yielding to that grace. And by that dynamic of coming together with God, by yielding to him and then his, his love working in within us, he, he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure, it brings about the salvation experience. That it brings about a total transformation. It's this, not this. And this is preached pretty much everywhere. It's in all, it's on the radios, the TV, it's on every church, um, every pulpit, in every, these church buildings everywhere. Talk to pretty much any Christian and, you, you know, they might sound nice and that, but then you get down to it, this is what they believe. And that's why they can do this, even the holiness side of the church, the sin repent cycle. Even the, the street preachers on the street, they, they imply this. They may not say it blatantly, but you ask them some questions. And you watch some of their stuff, and, and you, you'll see it there. Sin repent cycle. 
even Charles Finney, Sin Repent Cycle, I'll make a video, I'll make a video on him sometime. But I've got a chapter in my book which discusses the erroneous theology he taught. Um, so moving on, so we've got 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19. Again, that's where the word, the same word, cattle age, atonement, which we, we just read through. So the ministry of reconciliation, cattle age, and the word of reconciliation. So we'll reconcile, see, recon, reconciliation. Not a, 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 remember, atonement's an English word, and the English language has only been around, you know, so long. And like a, atonement, like in the Old Testament, is cover, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Because we'll, we're going to discuss that. Um... So the one point I wanted to make here was, you know, it talks about how in Romans 5.11, we receive the atonement, we receive the reconciliation. See, we're receiving that dynamic where we can be reconciled to God and then we're put in a right relationship with God through repentance and faith. Repentance proven by deeds and a faith that works by love. That state, that present abiding state, abiding in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, that's when we're aligned with, with God. And that's how we come into union. And that's why if we go to um, 1 John, chapter 4, and, and really think about this, where it says, um, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. So God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So if we're dwelling in love, real love, God's love, we dwell in God and he dwells in us. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. So if you're still sinning every day in, in thought, word and deed, how are you as he is in this world? You're not. And how do you have boldness on the day of judgment if you're sinning in thought, word, and deed every day? You don't. You've got to be abiding in the love of God, like it says here. And that, again, that, that you can say another parallel to that is Romans chapter 8, where it says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. That's where there's no condemnation. You know, if we're in the Spirit, there's life and peace because we're aligned with God spiritually. And that, and that spiritual alignment is reflected in how we conduct ourselves in our life. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple truth when you, when you strip all the fluff away and just, just read the Bible for what it says. And that's why I encourage people, just read through the scriptures. Read the whole books. Read 1 Corinthians, the whole book. Don't just get caught up in little sections where people try to twist things and take things out of context to try to argue in favour of sin. Don't do that. Just, just clear your mind. Just, what's the teaching? Start with Jesus. What are his words? Jesus never argued in favour of sin. He, he, he talked about setting people free indeed. I mean, you're either set free indeed or you're not. So now I'm going to um, when I have a look at a bit of um, how sin is covered, because that's a question I know a lot of people. Um, because atonement in the old um, atonement in the Old Testament it means cover. And we're going to look at some scriptures in the New Testament sort of, that sort of give us a bit of revelation on that. So I'm going to um, just read something I, I put together here. So if we turn to um, James chapter 5, verse 20, and it says, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now the word hide is Calucto, G2572. It says Aiken to G2813 and G2928 to cover up, literally or figuratively, cover, hide. So there's that, that cover word there, you know, will cover a multitude of sins. Now if we turn to Psalm 32 um, and read verses 1 and 2 and verse 11, it says this, it says, The Psalm of David Mashai, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So here we got the David talking about sin being covered, transgression forgiven, 
and then he connects it to, you know, the, the Lord not imputing iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So there's no guile in the spirit of this person. And then if we go to verse 11, in the same chapter, it says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous. He's talking about righteous people. And shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. So there's a connection between being upright in heart, having no guile, in his spirit, no guile, and being forgiven of the sin. You know, that, 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 or there's having the sin covered. And the word um, for covered in that is, is corsor. It's H3680 in the Hebrew. A, primi a primitive root, probably the plump, that is fill up hollows by implication to cover the clothing or secrecy. Clad self, clothes, clothe, conceal, cover, hide, overwhelm. Now, if someone has is upright in heart, and in their spirit there is no guile, are they engaging in sin still? No. It's impossible. See, see the picture that's starting to form in your mind if you're really listening and considering this? So how is sin covered? In each case, the covering or forgiveness is associated with being converted from walking the wrong way. Keep that in mind. And we're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 4. So think, think about this. So keep that in mind, what I just said, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. That's those, those two verses you just won't hear in the church system because they're just too confronting for people. Um, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Who shall, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? And for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Interesting statement there. You know, we live according to God in the spirit, the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. It all connects together. The harmony of the scriptures is just a beautiful and amazing thing. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity, which is love, um, agape, agapio in the Greek. Have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And the comment I'll make here is, is Peter speaking of a multitude of sins present in the church in verse 8? Of course he isn't. Those people were born again and pure, 1 Peter 1, 21 and 22, which I read earlier. Peter is contending for righteousness via suffering with Christ as one abides in the Spirit, whereby charity, love, you know, genuine righteousness, the righteousness of God, covers a multitude of sins. Now notice that James and Peter use the same language. So I'm going to read James 5.20. And 1 Peter 4, 8. And, and, and the, the cover and the hide is the same word. It's the same word. Um, Calupto. Which I've got up here on the board. So again, so James 5, 20. It says, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And in 1 Peter... Four eight it says, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. So hide and cover is the same word, corsor. There is a connection between abiding in Christ and the forgiveness of sins. So we've got Acts twenty six eighteen, which says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. So with that in mind, we're going to take a, a brief look at Romans chapter 3. And the, the, point I, the real point I want to make in Romans chapter 3 is um, 
we'll read up to it, but verse 31 I'll, I'll read first. It says, and this is the point to keep in mind, it says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. See, Paul understood that it's through faith that we establish the law or establish the righteousness of the law. Because remember how Jesus said, he said, you know, love God with all your heart, soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments is established the whole of the law and the prophets. See, that's the foundation. And in Galatians 5, 6, you know, it says, um, faith works by love. That's what Paul alludes to. When he's talking about people falling from grace because they're going back to circumcision, um, thinking that an outward ritual or rite will somehow make them righteous before God. When no, no, no. Paul's like, no, it's the faith that works by love. Because that's genuine righteousness, you know, abiding in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. Because love works no ill, Romans 13, 10. You know, because love fulfills the law. And that's that's the whole, that's how we're justified by the blood, because we enter into that love. We enter into the new covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is this is what the Bible teaches. And that's because the law, remember in Hebrews, so I'll read just a few scriptures from Hebrews before going to Romans chapter 3. Because remember in Hebrews it says, um, in, starting in verse, let me see, verse 14, it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So who, who does Jesus perfect forever by his one offering? Them who are sanctified. What's sanctified mean? Set apart, set apart unto holiness, set apart unto pureness, set apart unto God. See, those who repent, truly come to God, crucify their old man, and they come to God, they, they, they're set apart. That's who he perfects forever, perfects them in love, in their heart. Perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this, see, this is what it's talking about. See, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those, th those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. See how the, the sins and iniquities remember no more is connected to having the law written in the heart. And that's what we were reading. In, that's what's like implied in James and First Peter. It's, it's the same notion being converted from one way, walking one way, to another way. It's not this. It's nothing to do with this. This is theology and tradition of men, that men made up. You follow this, and you, you'll damn yourself, because you'll think that your justification is premised on some forensic something out there that Jesus made a legal swap for you, and then you're trusting in that. And it's a fiction. It's, it's made up. It doesn't exist. And that's why there's going to be many on... On judgment, you know, say, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name and did that in your name. And you'll say, I never knew you, you who work iniquity. See, the people who believe this, they work iniquity because this has not happened. They haven't been purged. See, if you're purged and purified, if you're established in covenant with God and your heart is pure, you're not working iniquity anymore. You can't. You can't work iniquity because you have a faith that works by love and love works no ill. See the difference? See, the, see, justified by the blood, see how the, the spirit, the lie and the truth, it's very clear and, and it, it's something so important to understand. And then once you grasp, grasp this, you can see through the lies in all these churches out there. You, can, you, can, you just hear it. You hear it out of their mouths. The, the pastors, the people, when you talk to them, they have no concept of God. They think they do, but they don't. And so, continuing here, it says, you know, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And then remit remission of these years, there is no more offering for sin. See, under this, they've got a continual offering. Because they think that Jesus is the advocate presenting the, the penalty paid, the swap, their position to God all the time for their ongoing iniquity. See, they don't study the scriptures. They just believe these isolated proof texts they pull out. And I'll, I'll probably make a video on Advocate, I think, because um, there's a lot of confusion around, around what that means. Um, the, 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 the word is actually parakletos, it's comforter, which is used everywhere else. And the word Advocate, it's, it's obvious, it's a biased um, rendering. 
Because Jesus isn't our advocate in the sense of this, no. He's the comforter in the sense of this. We enter into Christ and abide in him. And so if any man sin, like John says in 1 John chapter 2, we have you know, the comforter, the parakletos. Because there's a way to be reconciled to God if you're still sinning. You can, through repentance and faith, you can come to God before the mercy seat, like it talks about here. You know, where now we're remission of these years, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, the way of the Spirit, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Since he established the new covenant um, through dying on the cross. The, the veil was torn. It is finished. So instead of people going through religious works and, and a priesthood, no, they come directly through Christ through the Spirit in their hearts. You know, because we are the temple. Not a, not a temple, not a building. It's a building made with our hands. And we come to God with a true heart, like it says here, you know, a new and living way. You know, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the holiest by the blood of Jesus in a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. A true heart. Look that word up. True. It's honest. So it's coming clean with God about our past rebellion, turning away from that and, and yielding to God, yielding to the truth. You know, what's the condemnation? It's that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Because they didn't want, you know, uh, because our deeds have to be done in God. So let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, our, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then we let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for his faithful that promised. And, you know, then, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, we could encourage one another, the brethren, to, to remain faithful, stay in the fight, endure to the end. Because then there's the warning, for if we sin willfully, see, if we sin willfully, after what? After having been sanctified by the blood, having, after having approached God with a true heart and been cleansed. That's, what, that's the context of all this. So they never, the, the false teachers never read this whole thing in context. In fact, they don't read half of it at all. They, they kind of might refer to Hebrews 10, 26 and say, oh, it's going back to the law. It's, it's those who rejected the gospel and went back to the law. It doesn't say that. It says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, who's the knowledge? what's the knowledge of the truth? It's Jesus Christ. After we've received Jesus Christ, the knowledge of the truth, he's the light, the truth, and the way. After we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire and indignation who shall devour the adversaries. For he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment, supposing ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath consecrated the blood of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, not the blood of debt paid, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite the Spirit of grace. See, the person who willfully sins is the person who's gone through this, and then despises this and turns from this. That's, there's no sacrifice remains if you do that. Because you void it. You, you void all this. You cancel it out because it, it becomes no effect of you. And then you're left in a, a much worse state than you were in the beginning because you've actually seen the light. And it's likely you can't repent again from that. You know, I'll never say that there's no mercy for someone. But if you define repentance from, that, from doing that, it's very difficult nigh on impossible because um, you've actually despised the full knowledge of the truth. It's like you've met with Jesus Christ. You have met with Jesus Christ and then you've despised him. And that's a very serious thing to do. The people under this have never done that because they can't do that because they've never gone through this. So that, that, that's why this is a specific warning. Well, this is a specific warning for a specific people, for the real genuine Christian. But anyway, going back to Romans chapter 3, um, so the point I was making there was, you know, you know, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So if we go down to, um, 
24, being justified freely, see, justified by the blood, Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, the redemption is in Christ Jesus, in the spirit of his life. It's a manifest abiding state. It's an actual reality that we walk in every day. And that's and, re and redemption, you look up that word, is to be set free from bondage by the payment of a ransom. See, Jesus ransomed us from the bondage of sin through what he did. And then we partake with him, follow him, follow his example, um, enter into the covenant that he established by the blood and experience this. And then we're set free from that bondage. We're, we're redeemed from sin. So, so we and, and and it's on that basis that we enter into that that we're justified freely. Our past sins are not counted against us. There's nothing that we can do to to make amends for our past sins. It's, we're guilty and we can't change that. But God offers us free forgiveness, not not penalty paid, but to freely forgive them, like the this in the parable of the unjust servant, or the, the the servant who was forgiven his debt but didn't forgive his other servants, so the, the debt was reinstated. Again, that's a picture there of how being justified is conditional on entering into this. And when that servant rejected this, rejected, you know, because he wouldn't forgive his own servant, the, the debt was reinstated. So the debt can't be reinstated if it's already been paid. It doesn't make sense. See, this, this stuff doesn't make sense. It's all illogical when you, when you break it down and look at it. Um, so we're justified freely by his grace, you know, grace, the divine influence on the heart, the grace of God that brings salvation, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, it's that dynamic. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. See, God was, see, Jesus was set forth to be a propitiation. That's, a, that's the, an offering that expiates sin or puts sin away. Or it's mercy seat. You can look up that word. It's what we come before God. He's, he's the propitiatory offering that we approach God by seeking remission for our sin or seeking reconciliation, seeking forgiveness, seeking to be made right with God, seeking forgiveness. See, that's what Jesus, he died for. That's how it works. Not this, this. To declare righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness and that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. See, Jesus declared his righteousness. See, what did he say? He said, there is um, no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. Well, he, he did it more than that. He laid down his life for his enemies, like we were reading earlier. There's no greater love than that. And see, the new covenant is established on that principle of love, of, of, of a no greater love. And that's the foundation of the new covenant. So when you enter into this new covenant with God, you're, you're agreeing to be conformed to that standard. And that's why God is just in forgiving the, our past sins, because it negates any re-offense. Because we, we've actually agreed with God and said, yeah, we're wrong. I was wrong. I did the wrong thing. I put that all off permanently. It's dead. I put it on Christ. So he died. It dies with him. Then I'm raised up to newness of life with him to live for God, to live for righteousness. So we die to sin and then we live for righteousness. That's what the Bible teaches. So declare, I say, that this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded by what? By what law? Works? No. But by the law of faith. So there's no boasting because it's not by regimenting ourselves to some rules and regulations and trying to be righteous that way. No, it's by yielding our heart to God and then letting the love of God, you know, it's shed abroad in our heart and then we abide and walk in that. And see, there's no boasting in that because it's God working through us. It's not in and of ourselves. And that's what, that's what that, this means, that's what Paul's talking about. There's no boasting when you're abiding in Christ. It's not self-righteousness. As, as a lot of the people under this will try to accuse the people who are contending for this. So whereas the boasting then is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. You know, faith that works by love. Love works no ill. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 
is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. See, the law, the law of Moses can't justify anyone. You can't go get justified by being circumcised, um, keeping days and certain foods. No, it's by faith, the faith that works by love. That's how it all connects together. So do we then make the law void through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So I hope um, this sort of brought a lot more sense and understanding to things. And um, I thank you for watching.